Hello, my name is Yuriko Nagata. I'm a researcher and a member of a group called Nikkei Australia. I would like to thank the Tadaima organizers for this opportunity to talk about the Japanese internment in Australia. In 30 minutes, I would like to squeeze in a lot of things. A brief history of the presence of, of Japanese in Australia, what happened to them after uh, when the war broke out, and what happened to them after. In my presentation, I would like to um, use internees, former internees words as much as possible. I hope you enjoy my presentation. Nineteenth century Australia depended on cheap Asian labour to expand its primary industries. When Japanese migration to Australia developed in a similar way to Japanese migration to other parts of the world. It began with the supply of cheap labour in the 1880s for the pearl shell and sugarcane industries. They were followed by Japanese merchants who provided goods and services for the labourers. This paved the way for the later development of trade relations with Japan. The majority of Japanese in Australia were male indentured labourers, as they were not allowed to bring their families. The early Japanese presence was concentrated in the north of Australia, but there were some in the cities of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth. In 1901, the Australian colonies federated as the Commonwealth of Australia. The first legislation the new parliament passed was the Immigration Restriction Act, more commonly known as the White Australia Policy. Under this policy, non-white races were barred from both citizenship and permanent residency. Australian citizenship itself did not exist until 1949. Until then, Australians were classified as British subjects. The Japanese government strongly objected to this policy. So Australia allowed Japanese numbers to remain at the 1901 level, which was 3,602. In the same year, 248 Japanese women were included in the Japanese numbers on the national census. Many of them were prostitutes who had been trafficked into Australia. I mentioned these women as some later married and produced Nisei children. Here are some photos of pre-war Japanese communities in Australia. When the Pacific War broke out on December the 8th, 1941, Australia interned almost all registered Japanese on the same day. There were two precedents that accounted for this rapid response. The first was during World War I when Germans were interned. The second was Australia's internment of Germans and Italians at the outbreak of World War II in Europe in 1939. While Germans and Italians were interned according, according to the level of security risk, for the Japanese there was only one category, the presumed or proven existence of Japanese-ness. 
Although the majority of Japanese arrested that day were Japanese nationals, around 100 Australian born Japanese were included. Australian children of Japanese or non Japanese wives of Japanese nationals were regarded as Japanese under law. For example, Yasukichi Murakami came to Australia when he was 17. He later married an Australian born Nisei, Teresa, and they had nine children. All were arrested in Darwin and they lost their home and business, which was their lifetime's work. Their third eldest son, Joe, was just 14 years old. He recalled, That day the soldiers came and took us, didn't know what was going on, had to get everything together in a few hours. We had to abandon everything. 1,141 Japanese in Australia were taken into custody and sent to internment camps. In addition, Australia received 3,160 Japanese internees from New Caledonia, the Dutch East Indies, the New Hebrides, New Zealand, and the Solomon Islands. So the total number was 4,301. The largest group was those from the Dutch East Indies, which later became Indonesia. The Australian group accounted for only one third of the internees. Women and family groups were put in Tachura camp and single men were in Loveday and Hay camps. In this talk, I will focus on Tachura and Loveday. In general, Japanese internees were compliant and complained little. All their daily essential needs were guaranteed and food was plentiful. According to ex-internees, the camp administration was flexible and tolerant. For example, internees requested more rice in exchange for less meat the camp authorities and trusted management to internee committees and allowed a certain amount of freedom. The late Evelyn Suzuki, a Nisei from Thursday Island, reflected on her internment. Although I deeply regretted the gap in my formal education, it seemed to me that it was in our best interest to be interned because of the deep-seated and intense hatred directed against the Japanese. Many Nisei internees grew up speaking different languages, English, Indonesian, Dutch and French, and many spoke no Japanese at all. At Love Day, there was a group of Nisei who grew up outside Japan. Zenichiro Satonaka said, I was only 19 and didn't understand what bowing to the sun meant. One man came up to me and said, Sore demo nyonjin ka? Are you really Japanese? Because of the different backgrounds of many internees, there were differences in how patriotic they were. Internee committees in all camps were run by Ise, and so Japanese camp leadership tended to be very patriotic. They regularly observed national celebrations, including the day of Japan's entry into the war on December the 8th, 1942. A Tachura internee, Mary Nakashiba of Darwin, recalled, When the committee was organizing an anniversary of the Japanese bombing of Darwin, I was angry 
and so were other Australian-born Japanese. My father's home country was hurting my country. She is referring to the fact that Darwin was bombed 64 times during the war. When the war ended, as in other parts of the world, some Japanese internees did not believe Japan had lost the war. In both camps, there was tension between those who welcomed the end of the war and those who did not believe Japan had surrendered. In August 1945, at the end of the war, 3,268 Japanese internees were in the Australian camps. 800 or so had left Australia during the war on prisoner exchanges. 193 had died in the camp from illness, while 94 babies had been born. The government's decision was that all Japanese nationals, other than those born in Australia and those whose family members were born in Australia, would be sent back to Japan. This meant many families were separated, especially internees from other regions, New Caledonia in particular. After being interviewed by the Director of Security, around 140 former internees were gradually released into a country full of anti-Japanese hatred. The return of Australian prisoners of war confirmed the atrocities that the Japanese military had committed. Some Japanese Australians received reparations for war damage. But Peggy Shiyosaki describes what happened. We lost everything. That's the worst part. But we couldn't do anything about it. They just gave you war damage. But that, what that, but that wasn't as much as you were supposed to get. Because of the high level of anti-Japanese sentiment, former Japanese internees gave up all claims to Japaneseness and attempted to disappear into the mainstream population. The few Japanese who remained were separated by vast distances and often had to try to come to terms with what, ha what had happened to them in isolation. Jo Murakami moved to Japan during Japan's period of economic growth in the 60s. He studied Japanese and found employment. He is 93 years old now, living in an aged care facility in Japan. Jo was one of the first former internees I reached out to for my research. Back in 1988, he wrote, Being subjected to such mental trauma in the formative years of our lives, in constant fear of being asked about our ancestry, having no other like us for, for mutual consolation, have left us socially incapacitated and unfulfilled to this day. My brother are still mentally, fi uh, financially and geographically restricted. Now too old to change the course of their destinies. The Japanese community that has developed in Australia since the war has few links with the pre-war community. But some Small progress is being made to record the history of the Japanese wartime experience. There, has, there have been a number of visits to the former campsites by families from Australia, New Caledonia, Indonesia and Japan.
Miss Irene Matsumoto of Broome, was interned with her Japanese father and Aboriginal mother. And she doesn't want an apology. She simply wants Australians to know the story of what happened to the families like hers. Only a few Japanese former internees have publicly spoken about their experiences in the newspapers and on the radio because they wanted a formal government apology. However, compensation cannot legally be claimed because the Australian government had legislated so that every action taken against people it classified as enemy alien was lawful. I did this research and wrote a book on the subject many years ago. Only a handful Issei were alive then. So my interviews were mainly with Nisei and their families. I interviewed approximately 60 former internees and their family members. Only a few of them expressed anger, while most of them accepted that their lives were destroyed through human failings. In 2015, I had the precious chance to meet Mary Nakashiba. She died last year at the age of 93. Here is her moving statement about her parents. I think about, I think the hardest thing about the war for my particular family was that my father had migrated in 1890 and in those days you migrated permanently and he had become an Australian although he had never been granted um, citizenship because of the fact that they didn't grant citizenship at all but I think he felt that this was his country. He had converted to Christianity and we, he did not agree of course with the terrible things that happened. They, we, they gradually came to light after the war. All of the terrible atrocities and what happened, and also the fact that a personal friend had been beheaded. The Reverend Kentich was a personal friend. For my father, he was Japanese. He never ever felt any different. But I think that, and I, I felt it too with him, because I'm of that blood. It was a sort of a collective guilt. You felt that your countrymen part of my inheritance. These are the dreadful things that they did. Mind you, the Germans perhaps would do equally as bad in a, in a different sort of a way. But it was part, I suppose, of the military culture. Each country has a different military culture. And this is something that my father had never been to war. And I suppose he couldn't understand it either. And that was something that was of a great burden to him. And I think, of course, that I felt that too, because I was very close to my father. All our children were. He was a very loving father. I have a great admiration for my father. I'm sorry, but I am very, very sorry for what the war did to him and to my mother. But that was inevitable. That was inevitable. But he never, ever tried to pursue compensation. I don't think he ever felt that he was a victim. He knew that this was war and things happen in war. He understood history and he understood his culture and he understood the culture of Australia. Before I finish, I'd like to show you the only known footage of the Love Day internment camp. It was made as a propaganda film to represent how contented and productive life was for the internees. <laughs> 
As a final reflection, I want to ask, what have we learned from all this? With wholesale internment of refugees, ethnic profiling, religious and racial wars, and destruction of families across the world. The lesson to be learned from this small part of diasporic history is that it can happen again, and it can happen to anyone. Thank you very much.